Hello, welcome to the University of Brighton podcast. I'm Richard Newman. Welcome to our makeshift studio. And I think this will be this way for quite some time. My guest this week is Dr. Sarah Pitt, who's a microbiologist at the university. You may have heard her a lot on the radio recently. You've been sending us your coronavirus questions once again via social media for the third of our virus Q and A's. So we'll be getting cracking with that shortly. Um, Sarah, you've been very busy. Um, and actually you're the first person to make a second appearance on the podcast. So how are you doing with everything? Yes, well, I'm finding working at home quite challenging. I have um, some, uh, I'm working through three different devices at the moment and I'm, I'm finding that quite, it's fun, put it like that. Um, <laughs> And so I go for my daily walk up onto the downs because I live in, live in Lewis. So I can go up onto the downs for my daily walk, which is lovely. Although yesterday I got absolutely soaked through mm. right to the right to the very skin. I thought my phone, which was in my pocket, was going to drown because it was so wet mm. yesterday. But generally the weather's been lovely. So it's been really nice to get out, get a bit of fresh air and clear your head before you start working. Yeah. And the other thing I've been doing, because I'm a health and care professions council registered biomedical scientist um i've actually volunteered and gone back to the hospital so i have a an honorary contract with the bsuh trust now and i'm helping out in virology with the covid19 testing because because i'm actually a virologist mm. and what i've been doing interestingly enough is they've got plenty of people to actually do the testing even though i would be um qualified to do that but what they wanted was somebody to give the people who are going to be redeployed to do the COVID testing a little bit of background in the virology so I've actually been doing sort of teaching seminars so it's a little bit of a busman's holiday so I'm very happy because I can do all the nerdy stuff about what the virus looks like and why did we they call it SARS-CoV-2 how it's similar to SARS-CoV-1 and um, which bit of the virus are we actually testing for in the test um, and, and things like that. So it's been quite fun. And also I've, I've been doing face to face teaching again, which is which I'm missing quite a lot. Yeah. And, and um, I guess in some ways you're quite lucky then because you get to um, not many of us are getting much face to face contact with uh, many other people apart from our own household. So you're actually in quite a privileged position at the moment, I imagine. We're all quite envious. It's nice because I'm actually allowed out for more than just a daily walk in to go to the supermarket. I, I can drive into Brighton and um, healthcare workers uh, can park for free in, in Brighton near the hospital anyway. So I can do that too. And um, so that's, that's quite nice. And I, I feel like, you know, everybody wants to do their bit to help. And I found, I found a little niche where I can, where I can do something useful, which, um, was within my comfort zone and also doesn't it allows me to keep on doing my university uh, job as well. Mm. Okay, let's get stuck into the questions, Sarah. And um, plenty have come in from our students and staff. Um, okay. A lot of them are anonymous, so for consistency, we won't attach names to them. But lots have come in, so we'll just uh, we'll get started, and um, then we, we may sort of jump around a little bit. But let's see how okay. we go. Okay, so the first question has come in. It says, um, will an effective vaccine be ready soon for public use? I would have to say, I, I, I don't think so. Obviously, I'm not a vaccine expert particularly, but one of the things I would um, caution people about is that we don't really understand how immunity to this new virus actually works but what we do know is that 25 percent of normal common colds are caused by coronaviruses so related viruses and you keep on getting colds don't you so the chance that it's because you don't necessarily make a strong and long-lasting immune response to the cold that, it, that you have this year which is why you can you can get it again next year so one of the things we don't know is which bit of the immune, you will make a response to the virus inside your body, but which bit of it will actually be the right thing to put in the vaccine. That, that's one issue, which people are working on the vaccine, so I'm assuming they're kind of teasing some of that out. But 
But the next thing is going to be how long it takes to produce a safe and effective vaccine, which can actually be um, given to, you know, probably everybody in the whole world is what we're looking at, what we're going to need. Um, and one of the issues with testing out the vaccine is most countries have been very good at stopping the spread of the virus. So if once you go into human trials with any kind of treatment, you're sort of saying group A have the vaccine or the drug or whatever, and group B are the placebo group because you've got to test them against each other. And we expose all of them to the same, to the same thing. Either they've got the same underlying disease or they have, um, we'll put them in, the, we'll see if whether if the people with the vaccine get the infection and the people who don't have the vaccine don't get the infection. Of course, since the actual virus we're hoping is not really being passed from person to person very much, then the vaccine trials could be, could take a long time before they get enough data to see whether it's actually working in um, stopping people from getting the virus. So there's two things. There's the, the general thing that it takes about at least 18 months to get a vaccine um, up to being safe to use in humans. And then there's the, long, the longer term study to see whether it's actually going to work at all is a, is a different question. So the answer is, when it depends what you mean by soon, but this calendar year is starting to look a bit unlikely. Maybe yeah. by Christmas we might have something, but it's probably not going to be that soon. Okay, we're going to come back to the vaccine. There's plenty of variations on that question and uh, going off in different directions. Um, it sort of leads on to the next question, though, which is uh, a question which asks, in the short term, is it more realistic to find effective drug treatments with drugs which are already approved for use? Well, I mean, obviously, ideally, that would be a good, that would be a better plan than trying to develop a whole new vaccine if that was possible. But one of the, one of the issues is that they tried this quite extensively with uh, the original SARS, the 2002-03 version of SARS. And they've tried quite a lot of drugs, antiviral drugs, things that work against influenza virus, and found that they don't work. And partly because it was getting very difficult to actually to find something that could work, and partly because SARS-1, if you remember, just kind of went away. So therefore, people started asking, why are we putting funding and effort into testing, trying to find drugs to treat a virus which has gone away? Um, and people stopped funding the research. So it kind of got to a certain point and then sort of stopped. So I think in one way, we're quite lucky because we've got to a certain point with the original SARS and that are the current coronavirus, the COVID-19 virus is very closely related to, to the original 2002-03 SARS. So people could build on the work that's happened before. But again, I have to say, I have to disappoint the questioner that we haven't actually made all that much progress so far. So um, it would be a better solution if it was possible, but I'm not sure how possible it is. Question for me then on, on, on the back of that yes. is um, if the research stopped last time, have people learned their lesson that this time we need to, that, that sort of thing can't happen again, because to, so, it is, so we're much more prepared next time when this comes around, if it comes around. You'd, you'd like to think so, but a lot of people are talking about when this is all over, our perspective on life and our priorities in the world will have all changed and we'll start valuing healthcare workers more than people who make lots of money but whether that actually lasts beyond sort of this time next year is a is a moot point, isn't it? Really, um, depends on how lasting that is. And the other thing is, research that sort of particularly that sort of research takes a lot of money. And if there are strains on the system, it's a question between funding treatment for a patient that needs it now or researching into uh, treatment for a disease which is prevalent now as opposed to making sure we're prepared for the next pandemic if there's a balance between those two things the here and the now as in all aspects of life always wins wins out you know if you're hungry you're more likely to eat something and put off that other job that you were supposed to do because being hungry kind of it comes to the fore in your mind and so it's a similar idea that if if there's a strain on resources and we're looking at researching something that may never happen, 
that will go you'd, you'd like to think that we would change our priorities but i'm not i'm not sure we will mm. okay next question does the virus react differently with different blood groups that i don't know there are some viruses where we do know that sort of thing um but i'm not sure that that's something anyone's really looked at in any in any depth i mean that could be interesting to find that out it, it, that's the sort of thing that people would find out in retrospect so when we're looking at the data in in six months time and look at who uh did get sick and who got the most you know who got the most who got the most ill was there anything in those people had in common about the people who got most sick and the people who ended up in intensive care for example mm. but i'm not aware of any that anyone's done any work on that to, to up until this point but it's a very good and interesting question mm. um with experience of how previous um sars and has uh, have has developed um is there a concern that if uh, a country successfully does trial a vaccine and it is approved that they'll hang on to it and won't distribute it worldwide I'm, i've heard people talking about that and the one of the this is more of a political thing rather than a scientific thing that's mm, yeah, it sure it's people who it's the attitudes of the different countries to um, protect their own countries and their own people and, and close their borders in order to prevent um, the, the spread of the disease that's happened so far but also if you look at the scramble for uh, personal protective equipment across the world everyone's like well we need it for our people we're not going to give it to you and so on or we'll sell it to you for a large amount of money um, I really really hope that the scientific community makes sure that doesn't happen because it would be silly it's best to vaccinate everybody in the whole world. But I can see that in some countries that might happen just because your self-preservation instinct would kick in. But I mean, that's more of a political thing than a scientific thing. Sure. Okay, next question is, will we ever have a COVID-free world or will it always be around? There are, well, there are two ways this could go. So the 2002-03 SARS did go away. And the reason it went away is because uh, the transmission from from person to person just stopped because what we'll now what we now calling social distancing and um, all the other control measures which they put in at the time in the parts of the world that had SARS actually worked so well that the virus had no new hosts to go to so we could do that but the trouble is because it's gone all around the world that would actually be quite a difficult thing to to achieve now because it's if we if it was just clustered even let's say just in europe if we stopped it from being passing to person to person in europe and then stopped everybody in europe from traveling to the rest of the world for a little while until we made sure that there was no virus in any in any any person from europe um, then that would work but i'm not sure that we've kind of got to that point but what everybody sort of needs to remember is this is a brand new virus um, and it's got into humans through a series of mutations. The virus is, doesn't really want to be in human beings. It's viruses that normally live in animals don't really want to be in human beings. So, and humans don't really want that virus to be there. Normal, normally, you're, we're in equilibrium with most of our pathogens. Something like measles has been inside human beings for, you know, thousands of years. Well, certainly, certainly hundreds of years, and so we're sort of evolutionarily we've kind of evolved together, and we sort of know how to live together. Occasionally, people get very ill, and occasionally people can die from measles. But mostly, you're you sort of you're we're mostly will get ill, but we'll mostly survive. And certainly, um, a, a large percentage of the human population will survive measles, which allows measles to carry on transmitting to new people. So when it's the brand new virus the virus is sort of going oh my goodness how did i get in here and the human your human immune response which is also kind of developed uh, over time through evolution is going oh my goodness what is this thing i don't know so some of the symptoms that you'll see is um a, an, an overreaction of the person's immune response um and so eventually we'll have to settle down and it's possible that it will go away as I said like sars one did or it's also possible that it will just, the virus itself will just 
mutate slightly and dampen itself down so that it therefore is able to live in equilibrium with the human population a bit more easily. What people um, sometimes forget, I think, is that the 2009 um, swine flu outbreak, that in, which was a pandemic flu and it was a brand new virus and it did, you know, a lot of people got sick and a lot of people died, but it is still around. If you, when we test for the strains of flu that are in seasonal flu during winter, um, that swine flu is still in, it's still there. We can still pick that up in, in people's samples. So it, it, that, and it, it's a different sort of virus and the mechanism for uh, dampening itself down will be different, but it's possible that it might do that. Otherwise, you know, the virus won't, the virus won't be able to survive. It just goes around killing lots of people all the time. That, it's not sustainable from the virus's point of view, let alone from the human population's point of view. So it might stick around, but it might not be quite as nasty as it is right at the moment. That's really interesting because we don't hear that very often, no. um, especially in the media. Um, and if they're talking about mutations of viruses, then we only hear about the possibility of it getting worse mm. rather than the possibility that actually it, 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 it may get you know, less, it, it may not be as bad for you. Yes, I mean, obviously, I'm it's speculation on my part. I sure, sure, sure. It's but not I, necessarily true, but it's, that's but it's not an argument. That does tend to happen. Yeah, and it's not an argument that, that's, that's usually put forward. So it's really interesting to hear. No. And a little bit of optimism too. Um, yes. We all need a bit of that. So that's good yeah. um, without yeah. obviously yeah. taking anything um, for granted. Okay, um, so the next one is um, about testing. We've got some coming up on testing now and obviously one of okay. your specialisms. Um, so mm -hmm. um, how important is the testing? And for people that haven't, been, haven't seen any of these tests yet, what are they like? How quick are they? And how sophisticated are they? So the test for the virus, the one that involves you taking a, a throat swab or a nasal swab and then that gets sent off to the laboratory, what they're actually doing is they're testing for the, um, the genetic material of the virus. So this, some, uh, some students will be familiar with a technique called the polymerase chain reaction, the, science, the biological science students should be, and that's the technique that they use to detect um, detect the virus um, and so they are they're done in um, done in laboratories and the you uh, process the sample put it into an analyzer and the the process of, of detecting and then um, what they do is they detect it detects the genome in a, in a particular way and then makes lots of copies of it so it therefore becomes there's lots of that one thing which is a copy of the virus and therefore it's sort of against the background of all the other things that might have been in the swab the the genetic material of the virus stands out and therefore you're right you can detect it they use a sort of fluorescence um detector uh sorry a fluorescence marker to, and they detect they detect the strength of that fluorescence marker that's kind of signal um and so the there are various different um, test kits which are around. One of the problems is uh, a lack of uh, lack of resources and a lack of reagents, which means that different hospitals are using different kits at the moment and, and different actual machines as well. And so um, there uh, depends on how long the, the different kits take a different amount of time. But you're looking at a working day before you can get a result. Some of them are a little bit quicker than that, but um, there's pro you've got to process the sample before you start the test, then you've got to read the results, and then you've got to report the result, look at the results and decide whether it's positive or negative and then and send off the report. So we're looking at at least a working day before the result is actually ready. So that's the test for the actual virus. Um, would you like me to talk about the antibody test if you've been asking about yes, that Yes, well, yeah, people have been asking about that, so that would be a good time to do it. The, the, the general questions are, you know, how useful would that be? Um, how far away are we from seeing one? And then how helpful would it actually be to ease social, physical distancing and get things moving again by having this antibody test? So, as I mentioned earlier, we don't really understand the immune response to um, coronaviruses in general and, that, and to this brand new um, coronavirus in particular. So, the tests which could detect the antibody are, um, we're, not, we're not really sure which bit, 
which antibody would be the right one to look for because we just don't really know that yet. So that's one of the issues. We do know with um, the 2002-03 SARS, some people did make an people did make an antibody response. But when researchers went and followed up people, so they tested people at the time when they got ill, and then they tested them sort of a year later. And in the one study I've looked at, 10% of people had lost their own body altogether in that intervening 12 months and that was just one quite small study but it, therefore it's clear that you might lose your antibody right um and so the one issue is which antibody should we be testing for that that's a sort of a, a scientific question and then the technical question is the antibody tests certainly particularly the ones that they were touting um early on the home testing kits are not very good. So the ones which I'd seen were suggesting that um, it would pick up 60% of the, you know, it'd be correct 60% of the time. So that means that 40% of the results would be wrong either way. So you either, you either said you had the antibody when you didn't or vice versa. I don't think that's good enough for what we, I mean, it's, I don't think it's good enough anyway, no. but it's definitely not good enough for what we're wanting to use it for here. So first of all, we have to identify what is the antibody we need to really test for. Then we have to have a much more robust test than we actually do have at the moment. So um, I do know that people are working on laboratory based laboratory based tests which would be a blood you'd have to have a blood sample taken mm -hmm. those ones look more promising because the technology around those is better so it's more likely to be you know have, have a better chance of the result being correct mm -hmm. but it is predicated on the fact that we have identified what antibody we should be looking for in the first place so it's two things which are going on there and they're both quite complicated sure well, that's again that's really interesting and again it's it's a bit of myth busting because we've seen um politicians and again people in the media have been talking about actually been comparing uh, a home antibody test with a pregnancy <laughs> test which uh, <laughs> is and, and the differences in percentages there that you're talking about are, are massive so um it's nothing like what's being touted as a equivalent to a pregnancy test at all and the other thing which people forget with uh, the home pregnancy test and other sort of home tests that you can do, but certainly the home pregnancy test, the one they're picking on, that's been going for 25 years or something. So when, it, when we first had home pregnancy tests, they were a bit rubbish. So you, you, you did your home pregnancy test, then you went to the doctor and you got another test done by a different method in, in your local laboratory just to confirm the, the result. And also, you also, um, if you got a negative result, but you thought you were pregnant, you kept on doing it for a couple of two or three weeks and just to make sure that it wasn't a false negative result, which it often was because they were a bit rubbish. But now they're really very good. The home pregnancy tests are really very good because the companies that make them have refined the technology over a period of, I say, you know, 15, 20 years. We've known about this virus for three months. It's four months now, I think, isn't it? They've been working on these tests for probably two months. You wouldn't expect them to be that much good and certainly nowhere near as good as the home pregnancy test because there's not been time to, to develop it. You, I think that's another thing that people um, don't quite realise. These, these things just don't happen just because you can do it one with one type of uh, infection or one type of condition it's looking for a completely different thing you know in the pregnancy test it's looking for a hormone and so um the only thing that's, that's the same about it is it's a little comes in a little testing strip but that's about the only thing that's similar so um you wouldn't it's it's unreasonable to expect them to be really really as good as the home pregnancy tests after this really short amount of time in order to to develop them it just doesn't it's, it's just not reasonable to expect that. Sure. Okay, I'm, I'm going to combine a couple of questions um, here, and um, because they, they, they could be they, they could be a bit political, so we sort of take the politics okay. out out of them and try mm -hmm. and, and and look at it from your point of view instead. Okay. So um, one question was about the the government testing numbers, which we see we've seen all the time about you know hitting a certain amount per day, and then how that might change and go up again. Is that realistic? That's one part of the question. The second part of the question is, um, was the with regarding testing, um, was the UK um, too slow with this in comparison to other countries like we've seen South Korea do, 
like we've seen Germany a bit closer to home, New Zealand seemingly at the end of their wave, even though they are a much smaller country, of course. So that's another part of the question. And the, the third part of the question, actually, really, just combining another one is, if we're to come out of this one, uh, and, and we, we drop those numbers down, is track and trace, have we learned our lesson, is that the way forward to get out of this? Initially, we didn't have the facilities to do the number of tests that, that they were actually saying that they wanted to do. Um, and they decided, they actually sort of had two systems going. You've got the NHS laboratory system, which were ready, ready and waiting with registered practitioners, with laboratories which were set up to handle patient samples in um, uh, respectful and uh, respecting the, the patient themselves, respecting GDPR, patient, patient confidentiality and so on. And we're used to getting a sample in, you know, giving it a, a lab laboratory number and then putting it through the system and then getting it out of the other end with the right result for the right um, patient. We know how to do that in hospitals. But I think they were slightly worried that the hospital laboratories would be a bit overwhelmed if they decided to do large numbers of just COVID-19 testing. Because certainly in, in the beginning of the, of the pandemic, um, the hospitals were also dealing with um, all other sorts of illnesses. So the hospital laboratories were also testing for everything else that we have to test for. So they decided to have these um, centres which they set up just to do covid 19 testing but um then there became then there came sort of a um and so that's how they they want to increase the numbers of tests but it's a little bit uncertain on the ground what's going on so um in the hospital laboratories they could do more testing and sort of wait ready and waiting um the rate limiting step for them the problems for them is the actual the kits as i said before there there are lots of different kits going around and people are sort of different parts of the country using different one because of the scarcity of resources so um the big testing labs were set up using different machines and different kits again and uh, and they were all sort of it wasn't properly coordinated and that was a little bit of a that was a little bit of an issue so the num the way we're going to improve, increase the number of tests is and to do it is to have all these different testing centers but actually to do it properly it's got to be coordinated. I think people, at the laboratory scientists are now starting to work together and get a handle on that a bit better. But at the beginning, it was all a bit, oh, you can do that, you can do that one over there, and you can do that one over there, and you can do that one over there. Understandably, I think everyone was trying to react fast and set some. So um, that, that was one of the problems. So we could go up to the numbers of tests which they're talking about. I'm not. I'm not sure that the time scale that the government are um, suggesting is necessarily all that realistic. I don't think they're necessarily going to meet the mark of um, 100,000 tests a day by the end of this week, or effectively this week at the time of at the time that we're recording this. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that <clears throat> that will necessarily happen. Um, but I mean, I think, and I think it, we there's a little bit more planning, a little bit more coordination needs to go in. To do that um, and the other thing which is not always clear is that the testing centers that I'm talking about the testing laboratories where there are three there's one in Milton Keynes there's one in Glasgow and there's one in Alderley Edge in Cheshire at the moment um, <coughs> sorry but <coughs> when the testing centers that people are talking about where you drive to a car park and have a swab taken that's just a sample collecting center so if you if you're a, a key worker and you're allowed to go and have a test or they're talking about sending the tests to your house, but actually what all they're doing is sending you a swab. You then, that again sent off, and those ones I think are being sent off to the lab in Milton Keynes. So uh, if you go to a car park in Surrey or Sussex, it'll go to the lab in Milton Keynes. So the logistics of transporting all the specimens uh, in, a, in good time, and also that, to make sure the right sample gets the right number, that you get the right result at the end, in these big testing centres, when samples have come from all over, all over the country, so there are logistical issues with with um, having that number of tests. And we probably could have gone. A, we didn't want to go slowly, but we could have perhaps gone a little bit more slowly and set it up a little bit more carefully, rather than kind of trying to do it fast. Um, but then that brings you to the second part of the question: Were we a bit slow to react 
So we could have started planning for this earlier on, I, I, I think, because um, we knew it was coming down the line and we could have actually had, had plans. But then it's difficult to say that because I wasn't involved in planning at sort of, uh, uh, sort of national level. I'm involved in advising at national level now to my professional body, but I wasn't involved in, and I was involved in planning from, from my point of view as a hospital laboratory scientist. But I don't, um, I don't have experience or inside knowledge of what was happening at sort of the, at the higher level, let's say at Public Health England at that, that time and what plans were being made, even if they probably were being made. Um, the, the, you, there are good reasons why we did decide not to do loads and loads of tests. They're quite expensive. I mean, everyone says oh, we should do lots of tests, but they're actually quite expensive to do. And I think the original plan of um, contact tracing was was the really good one that was the best one and so that's probably why we didn't decide we were going to do loads and loads of tests we weren't going to test everyone we were going to find the people who had symptoms and then we were going to talk to the people who had been in contact with them identify those people and just test those people and ask them to self-isolate or take them to hospital if it if needs be and that that. Yeah, and we decided to go back to that now. We, if we'd stop, stuck with that plan in the first place, the, we might not might not be needing hundreds of thousands of tests a day now because we would have been able because we would have been able to just identify the small clusters and perhaps um, I don't know whether the number of cases would have been any uh, any lower, but we might have been able to identify who were the cases more easily without doing tests. One thing I would like to say is people are talking about care homes a lot and they say, oh, they only did three tests in this care home. Um, what that people is, does, I've never see, heard this reported either, is that it's normal standard practice. If there's an outbreak of an infection, whatever that infection is, in an institution or hospital ward or in a care home or in a school, what they will do is they'll go in and say, 25% of the people in this in this care home have got these symptoms. They will get samples from a representative five or six people, take those off to the laboratory, they'll test those, and if all if they've all got the same strain of the same infectious agent, they will just assume, this will work on the basis of assuming that all the other people in that institution, be it our school or our care home, have also got the same um infection and then implement the infection control measures that you would do so the fact that they haven't tested everybody in care homes all the time you know they've only tested two or three people in a care home at once that's normal standard practice for public health um procedures so that i don't i don't think that that's something that they, we should be criticizing anybody for because that's not what we normally do it's just that now it looks like there were a lot of cases in care home. In retrospect, people are going, well, why didn't you test my granny? But, but at the time it was normal standard practice, which normally worked fine to do it that way. So I think that's something else which isn't really reported much. Well, quite a few more questions left. So what we're going to do with the rest okay. of them is sort of um, sort of rattle through almost like rattle a quick fire. Them, yeah. Sorry. Um, some quick fire questions, basically. A lot of these on transmission or they're about... Um, about physical distancing, I think, really. So okay. um, if we sort of, I'll sort of rattle through them. So the first one is, should I sterilize my groceries after buying them? Um, I do. I just get a, a dish, dish cloth with washing up liquid, so just some detergent, and I just give them a quick wipe down. I don't know whether it's necessary or not, but um, it can't do any harm, and I definitely do do it. It's an enveloped virus. It's quite weedy, so as soon as it comes into contact with detergent, that's the end of that. Just in, in case you did have something on it. Okay. Um, do we need to wear face masks? Scotland's now advising it, and I don't know what I should do. That's not a question. Well, the problem with with it is, is we haven't been in England. Certainly, we haven't been issued with face masks. So, where are we going to get them from? And if there's a shortage of them, they are much better placed being for their healthcare workers who are on the front line, who are actually really in the line of fire and most likely to be exposed to it. So if they decide that we, the, the problem with face mask is that unless they're really properly fitted and properly tight, 
the virus can get in and out. And also the other thing is they are try they're there to protect other people more than protecting you from infection. It's is to the idea is to protect the virus for sorry, in the healthcare workers it's to protect the virus getting to them. But the, the idea of face masks out in the community when you're going to the supermarket or whatever or going on your walk is that if you happen to be um, have have the virus and you're asymptomatic and you don't know it it's to stop you unwittingly spreading it to other people but in order to do that you've got to have a really properly tightly fitting so there's no holes anywhere there's no gaps where some droplets could get through so unless they're all going to give us um, a pattern the material and a pattern so we can make them all at home or they're going to um, issue everybody every household with the with the mask that they need um, I think people should improvise if they feel that they want to. I mean, there's no reason not to, but if the government policy is that we should all wear pro properly fitting face masks, then I think they're going to have to provide them somehow or other, or at least yeah. provide them for us to buy. Um, naturally, loads of questions, obviously, about duration. Um, so I'm going to just pick a few which are on a similar sort of theme, but a little bit different. So um, let's go with um, this one. Um, too many people I know are getting bored of social distancing. It's not mm. natural. Can we really be expected to keep this going for months on end? Well, I think we have to. I think we've gone, we've come this far. And the, uh, the level of transmission of the virus has reduced and it's because everybody's been so good about doing the social distancing my my mother is 83 she has uh, an underlying health condition which means that she has to take uh, anti immunosuppressants and she also has a also her underlying condition involves her lungs so she is needs shielding on three different counts and i haven't seen her for two months i'm it would be if we stopped doing social distancing and then we have another transmission cycle, let's say in the autumn, where we all have to go lockdown again, that would be a waste of my, my, my mother, mine and my mother's sacrifice for actually not seeing each other um, for that, that length of time. And the other thing is my husband works at a different university and lives, um, when he's working, he lives up north. And because I knew I was going to be volunteering at the hospital, I decided to stay away from him as well, so I haven't seen him for two months either. So if people get bored of social distancing and just go around, you know, um, going out, you know, having it be in close contact with their mates and everything because they're a bit bored, and then we have a another transmission cycle, my sacrifice and lots of similar sacrifices that people have made all over the country will have been completely in vain. I might as well have gone to visit my mother. Um, so we and. But it has actually worked. And as I was saying very early, early on, it's possible that we could get to the point where there's no, if we're not, the virus isn't in someone and getting to another person because, because, because social distancing has worked to stop the transmission cycle from person to person in, in the population, then that would have, the virus will then go away. So for the sake of another couple of weeks, we could potentially make the virus go away altogether and then we can go back to so I, th I would urge people to be a little bit patient i know it's not i know nobody yeah. wants to sure. especially when the weather's nice and that absolutely so i'll pick uh, this next question then um similar sort of thing we keep hearing about having to adjust to a new normal when will we go back to the old normal i'm not sure we'll ever get back to the old normal and do, do we really want to go back to the old normal it depends on it depends on uh do we you know do, I suppose we will get back there eventually and everyone will crowd back onto the buses and we'll all start to, sort of mixing with our friends in close contact in, in the same way. But um, as things are looking at the moment, and it's very, very difficult to predict it, anyone who thinks they know what's going to happen is, they, they, nobody does. So mm. if they tell you, they think that, that, that you know, you, nobody knows what's going to happen. Um, probably the rest of this year we will be behaving at least cautiously towards one another but I suppose if you 
if you know that you haven't had the infection and nobody around you has had the infection, I don't think we're going to get to the point where you can never sort of cuddle your mother again. I think you you just sort of have to be. Um, uh, but I think we will probably be wary of strangers for quite some time to come. I think I will be. Mm. Um, but maybe that's just because I'm quite antisocial in the first place and I've kind of got used to, I give people funny looks when I'm out in the street anyway. So <laughs> I've, I've been lic- given license to do that. Maybe I'll just carry on. <laughs> maybe that'll be my new normal. <laughs> um, okay, two more very quickly on the same thing then. One's very topical um, to this particular podcast do you think we'll realistically all be back to work school and university in September or October I don't again I don't think we know for sure I'd like to think I'd like to hope so but that presupposes that everybody carries on with what we're doing at the moment and keep going on it for a little bit longer so that the virus transmission actually stops the danger will be that we uh, break out of it too early because we're bored and then we have an, and then you know what we don't want to happen is the schools and universities open in September and they're closed again by Christmas because there's been another there's been a second wave you know another outbreak that's what we really don't want to happen so I'm hoping that if everybody around the whole of the world stays sensible and, and stays a little bit cautious just for a little bit longer we could all be back to something resembling normal life by mm by September perhaps we will be wearing masks when we're doing lectures who knows I don't know what it's going to look like but yeah I'm I'm I hope so but I I don't know for sure no sure um absolutely we're all guessing um so those are more controlled environments so finally on this sort of topic realistically should we all be giving up hope of going to concerts cinemas sporting events theatres this year Again, it's hard. It's very hard to know, isn't it? Mm. Really, um, I suspect what will happen, certainly initially, is that just the number of people who are allowed to go to events will be reduced. So the number of tickets will be that they sell for for concerts or something will be less. Um, I'm not really sure. I'm I'm a massive football fan, and so I'm not really sure what's going to happen. Mm. with that whether we'll all be you know we do kind of sit quite close together and jump up and down and hug strangers at football matches whether we'll be allowed to do that anymore for, for a little while I'm not really sure um I just but I and I suspect things like going out for a meal will just be become something that's a bit more of a treat because you you won't be able to get a table at your favorite restaurant as easily as you used to be able to do because they'll only be able to offer half the number of tables so that people can sit a little bit further away from each other and it probably things like going to concerts and eating out will be a little bit more expensive because of because of that for, for a little while so um i would say again this is just me being hopeful that we will be allowed to go back to doing these things but it won't be as uh, not you won't be able to do it as often as you used to be able to do and it won't be quite as easy to get into places anymore and so, um, you know, cinemas, you might have every other seat would be empty so that you could do social distancing, which means you might not be able to get a seat at the showing that you were planning to go and see the film with. Um, but I can't. I, I, <laughs> there's a point where you just think we do have to get back to the things we enjoy doing. Yeah. And we don't want to go for too long without doing the things we love, but we might just have to get used to the fact that we some of the stuff we took for granted that was going to be easy to do might just be a little bit more harder to come by. And we, perhaps you might enjoy it more if you, if you can only go to the cinema every, every third, you know, a third of the time that you used to go, perhaps you'll enjoy it more. Yeah. Look, Sarah, thanks so much for answering those. These podcasts are so useful um, to do a bit of myth busting and get some real facts out there. So thanks so much for doing that. And um, best of luck with your work at the hospital as well. Thank you. So that's it for this week's podcast. If you've enjoyed it, please do subscribe to our YouTube podcast playlist. And for the full audio versions, on all the usual podcast apps like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Just search University of Brighton. For now, thanks for listening and stay safe.